Thank you so much for coming this evening. Um, I'm very lucky to have with me a very distinguished and exciting panel to sort of work through an immensely complex subject, which I hope we're going to actually embrace in its complexity. And there'll be, um, we'll talk for about an hour and then I think, I think at least half an hour to talk uh, with the audience. Um, I know, I was just thinking as this was starting, I guess, uh, I, I guess I qualify as a Ukrainian Jew. I was born in Kiev, I'm Jewish. Um, but growing up, I would never have thought of myself growing up in London as a Ukrainian Jew. Um, there was no Ukrainian Jewish community. There was no identity or even a story around this idea that I could associate myself with. Um, when the Maidan started, the, you know, the revolution in Ukraine in 14, um, I had my relatives who also were born in Ukraine and Jewish but now lived in the U.S., all calling me saying, this is terrible. Fascists have taken over Ukraine. I was like, what are you talking about? And they're like, we know, we remember our families, you know, the pogroms. We remember how terrible it was for Jews in Ukraine. And I was like, I, I think you may be getting some sort of poorly informed background on this. Um, but if this is an incredibly complicated and kind of dynamic area to look at. Um, and it's one that's being created. What is the Ukrainian Jewish encounter? What does it mean to be uh, a Ukrainian Jew? Um, and, uh, and that's what we'll be thinking about today in various aspects. We'll dip into history, we'll look at the present, we'll think about the future. Um, so the panel today is uh, uh, going from right to left. Um, Mark Fryman is a board member of the UJE, who are one of the co-organizers of this event. To my left is Professor Yaroslav Kritsak of the Ukrainian Catholic University, also taught at Harvard and Columbia. And on my far left is Osek Zissels. He's currently the director of VAD, which is an, a civil society organization uh, that brings together Jewish organizations and communities in Ukraine. But Osek is also kind of a, a very important figure in Ukrainian history. He's a very, very famous dissident and spent 10, 12 years in political... She's, she's stress, six, sorry. Six years in, um, in, in political camps in the Soviet Union. And we'll be dipping into that as well. Um, I think we'll start with history, though. We'll take a step back to try to somehow contextualize this very rich and difficult subject of Ukraine and Jews. Um, so, Yaroslav, you're the historian, so I'm going to start with you. Um, can you, you know, how can we talk at all about um, the idea of Ukrainian Jews, of how Jewish self-identification in Ukraine? And, and you can start as early as you like. I don't know, start with uh, uh, the medieval period or... Well, give us a little bit of context on this, on the subject. Probably the best way to start is somewhere in the late medieval, early medi modern times, but not to complicate things too much. Think about Ukraine, 16th, 17th century, or the one of the territories which has the largest number of Jews in the world. Say that Jews in the Kyiv or probably in Lviv, the two largest cities in Ukraine, had much more Jews than, say, in 19th century than, say, in New York, or Moscow, or Petersburg, and even Vienna. Because basically, the majority of Jews were living in this territory, was called Yiddish land, former Polish territory, and some large junk was living in Ukraine. So there was, to put the long story short, there were many Jews in Ukraine, probably too many Jews in Ukraine, but there were no Ukrainian Jews. So this provided you with some kind of the introduction with this research. So basically, uh, Ukrainian Jews, as a kind of identity, as a kind of group, is a very recent phenomenon. We may dispute when it started, basically, but say, at least in the 19th century, since I'm in the 19th century, you could tell, tell it confidently, there were some Jews who were speaking Ukrainian, there were some Jews who were marrying to Ukrainians, there were some Jews who were solidarizing with Ukrainian cause, but there were no Ukrainian Jews. And this is kind of general tendency, especially in this region between Berlin and uh, Moscow was a territory with a very extremely mixed population, ethnically, religiously, whatever you think about in any terms. So basically the story is that you have many two groups and each of the minority groups tended to, uh, tended to say, to support the ruling elites, which was very rational. So Jews was not exception in this case. So say you will have many Jews in Slovakia, you don't have, but you don't have any Slovak Jews. You have many Jews in Transylvania, Romanian Transylvania, but they're probably mostly Hungarian Jews, never Romanian Jews, and so forth and so forth. So this is basically the story. So when was the turning point started? Basically on the turn of the 19th, 20th century. 
And most importantly, and probably surprisingly, it comes with emergence of Zionism, with the two nationalism, Ukraine nationalism and new Zionism, which is kind of the, another version of the nationalism of that, that region. And quite of a sudden, they find a common language. And the common language was because they had a common enemy. In the Russian Empire was the Russian Empire, imperial rule. In the Polish territory was a Polish. Polish rule, basically, was still Hungarian Empire, with Austro-Hungarian Empire, but basically, for a variety of reasons, which would explain, it was basically Polish rule. And uh, for some reasons, uh, for sure, Ukraine and there was Ukraine is known for their anti-Semitism, and this is a long story to tell. But we should also take into account the Ukrainian nationalism was no, Ukrainian anti-Semitism was no exception. It was, I'm sorry to tell, it was rather a rule. In a sense, the Polish anti-Semitism was much stronger. Anti-Semitism, and so therefore it was quite natural for Jews, especially Zionists, to look for ally, alliance. And the, this natural alliance was Ukrainian, Ukrainians who were also against the Poles or against the Russian Empire in the in the in the uh, this uh, period. So to tell the long story short, just probably kind of paradoxical thing, that you probably know that that Jews were not recognized as a nation. Logistically, there was a religious group or ethnic group, but never as a nation, because nation presumes some kind of political rights and cultural rights. So the first national group who demanded, that demanded the Jews supposed to be recognized as a nation was Ukrainians. And they did the Austrian parliament. And there is a clear statement in 1908, when there is a Ukrainian deputy, member of the Austrian de 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 parliament, demanded that Ukra the Jews were supposed to be recognized officially as a separate nation. With all the, uh, with all the uh, implied uh, rights, all the kind of, kind, of, kind of things. So basically I'm saying there was a long tradition of the Jewish-Ukrainian dialogue, reconciliation, rapport, whatever you mean by that. And uh, this is one part of the story. The other part of the story that for sure, uh, because uh, Jews were living in this territory, there was a small, small minority, there was one middleman, uh, most of Ukrainians were living in the villages, Jews were more educated, living in the urban milieu, all the kind of things. So what I'm saying here, you have a, a lot of ground for the animosities, social, ethnic, religious. If you look in the Ukrainian proverbs of the time or sayings, you clearly could see that Jews in the popular understanding consciousness is the absolute other. That there's nothing that local peasant could and define themselves with the Jews. And since peasants made the majority population, 90% population, so to say, you could easily imagine the, 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 the size, the, the scale of the anti-Semitism. So on one side, you have a kind of very positive message record of Ukrainian-Jewish relations, basically when the leaders telling to each other, elitist leaders. And on the other hand, you have a society, mostly Ukrainian society, which is not just ready for this kind of dialogue, but just quite their perception. And therefore, Ukraine is known for a variety of the reasons, as a territory of the stable anti-Semitism. So therefore, it's very hard to tell the one story of the Ukrainian Jewish relations, always several stories, and always the story of what was prevail. So probably to, 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 to put the story short, to end some story short. So on the one hand, we have this kind of history of Ukrainian Jewish relations, there's a tradition, even so come very close to the uh, Jews and defined with Ukrainian uh, cause, but not becoming Ukrainian Jews. On the other hand, we have a long record of the anti-Jewish violence, anti-Semitism, starting with Smolnitsky, ending with the Second World War, and this is a very painful, long record. So the idea is what to do with those two, how to find a balance between, between these this two, 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 two stories. So uh, I believe that crucial point came after the Second World War, because after the Second World War, this distinction between Ukrainian and Jews started to disappear. First of all, Ukrainians ceased to be a peasant nation. They become a very much urban, educated nation, all kind of things, so the social distinction disappeared. On the other hand, both Ukrainians and especially Jews became more, more secularized, so therefore the religious difference also didn't play that much role. And also because they found themselves in the Soviet Union, there was a lot of this dialogue between Ukrainian and Jewish dissidents. So there's many chances for this reconciliation. But the turning point was the establishment of the Ukrainian state. Because since Ukraine became independent, this tendency started to work. Because Jews are supposed to solidarize, to sympathize, to find support for the ruling elite. And since ruling elite becomes Ukrainian, by definition, there was a chance for emergence of Ukrainian Jews. But this is not an automatic process. There's this possibility. This possibility was realized only with the Second Maidan, I believe. I believe the Second Maidan was really turning the point. 
And I wouldn't go to the story because I would save the story for the uh, Yosef to, to tell it, but I believe still what is the Second, Second World War is a turning point, and I believe Peter was modest enough because I do remember his article in London Book Review, Review yeah. Books, <coughs> which was, has a very interesting title, I'm Ukrainian. And this is believed that something tells that many Jews at that time, in Ukraine specifically, discovered their Ukrainian identity because quite of a sudden this Ukrainian identity was quite different than the previous historical record of this anti-Semitism or this kind of the violence or the kind of thing because quite of a sudden Ukraine appeared a very, <laughs> Ukrainian course appeared very much attractive, very much liberal, very much pro-European and with European values and things like that. And this created this kind of breeding ground for the emergence of the Ukrainian identity among the Jews. And we're still discussing where Ukrainian Maidan, the second Maidan, makes a turning point or point of no return in many senses. Unfortunately, we couldn't say this economical reforms get too far or political reforms are very, uh, very, uh, are very successful. So we're still discussing we have the turning point in this kind of political economical reforms. But what I believe the turning point in the Jewish Ukraine identity has been already trans transpassed. So there is no coming back. For the first time, we have this Ukrainian Jewish identity, and this is something we have to cherish, specifically Ukrainians. I'm just thinking what language I should ask Ossie questions in. Are you going to speak in Russian or Ukrainian? Okay, good. Then I will speak in Russian, so it will be the third language. Uh, but I don't want to send the translator mad, so hold on, I'll, I'll stick to English. Osik, I, I have to pick up on a point, though, that Yaroslav raised here. When you were in the Soviet political prisoner camps, which mixed, obviously, political prisoners and criminals, were there ethnic subgroups? Were there, like, Jewish uh, prisoners and Ukrainian prisoners and Russian ones, or did you all just become one group of political Ну, я все ж таки, по-перше, хочу сказати добрий вечір, good evening, потім подякувати організаторам за можливість цієї дискусії, а також подякувати за запрошення, мені дуже приємно приймати участь. Я ж, пан Ярослав майже не залишив мені можливості щось ставити в історичний аспект. І я тому не буду на цьому багато зупинятися, але скажу, що ідентичність, колективна ідентичність євреїв, європейських, вона ніколи не була довго однаковою. Вона змінювалася з часом, вона модернізувалася, як і інші ідентичності колективні. І переломний момент, я додам до того, що перелічив пан Ярослав, це була французька революція, бо саме після французької революції суттєво змінилася ідентичність європейських євреїв. Вони стали відчувати себе громадянами, вони були, отримали емансипацію в Європі, і вони стали, виникла така дивна формула – француз Мойсеєва закона, або німець Мойсеєва закона. Тобто це був момент утворення громадянських політичних націй, коли всі меншини, які знаходились в тих державах, асоціювали себе, ідентифікували саме з державою. Це державницький був підхід до нації, громадянський. Але оскільки конфесійність, релігійність була різна, то це була ознака відмінності. І це був ідентифікуючий такий маркер. І це продовжувалося досить довго, і наприкінці 19-го сторіччя сталося те, що сказав пан Ярослав, виникла нова ідентичність сіоністська, яка полягала в тому, що євреї вже не хотіли асимілюватися, окультурюватися, а вони хотіли створити свою державу, щоб продовжувати бути там євреями. Було багато чого, але в відношеннях між українцями і євреями на території України Таке враження, що багато сторіч був певний рок, тобто негативний аспект дуже сильний. Крім всіх зв'язків, крім спільної праці, культурних зв'язків і таке інше, були страшні події 17-го сторіччя, 18-го сторіччя, 17-го – це воїни Богдана Хмельницького, 
в 18-му це Коліївщина, в 19-му погроми наприкінці в Російській імперії, потім громадянська війна з її величезними вбивствами євреїв. І було таке враження не дослідника, а пересічних громадян, що всі спроби українських, українців створити свою державу, реалізувати соціальний процес чи національний, пов'язані з дуже великими проблемами, трагічними для євреїв. Це змінилося, але тільки в 91-му році, коли Україна стала незалежною державою. Вперше ми бачимо в історії, що спроба українців створити свою державу не просто вдала, вона вдалася, і цьому повороту також вже нема, і це головний чинник. І те саме сталося з відношенням до меншин, зокрема до євреїв. Бо, як каже нам і наш друг Мирослав Марінович, відомий дисидент, проректор Українського католичного університету, у українців змінився образ майбутнього, модель майбутнього. В цьому новому майбутньому, на відміну від колоніального, майбу... колоніального життя в Російській імперії, у них не було місця для того, що було антисемітизмом в Російській імперії або у совєтські часи. На жаль, ідентичність євреїв у совєтські часи піддалася дуже сильно асиміляції. Але ми повинні враховувати, що перш ніж приступити до асиміляції потужної, до наступу на релігію, до наступу на етнічні відмінності, совєтська влада або знищила всіх, хто їй опирався, зокрема і євреїв, які були проти совєтської влади, а всіх тих, хто не вона не знищила, вона викинула за кордон, в еміграцію. Тому залишилось тільки ті, хто здатні були пристосуватися. І це були і українці, і євреї, і всі інші. Бо це насилля і брехня, якими оперувала совєтська влада, вони примусили пристосуватися до тої ганебної системи соціальної, якою називалася Совєтський Союз. Євреї почали втрачати все, що в них було з ідентичності. Всі релігійні корені, всі історичні, мову, літературу. І так тягнулося до 91-го року. Бо вже в ті роки, що я пам'ятаю, 60-ті, 70-ті, 80-ті, все менше і менше було людей, які володили, володіли мовою ідиш. Про єврит я вже не кажу. Це взагалі були одиниці. Ті, хто знали історію. Я трошки пам'ятаю історію сторі, бо мені батько колись 50 років роки трошки розповідав. Але не було цілеспрямованого виховання, не було цілеспрямованої освіти єврейської ніколи у совєтські роки. І так було до тих пір, поки не створилася ідентичність, в якій було тільки два елементи, які можу позначити. Перше – це державний антисемітизм, який підштовхував євреїв залишатися євреями, бо вони не було куди дітися від того. І по-друге – це тайна симпатія до держави Ізраїлі, яка виникла у 48 році. Ось ці два чинники були єдине, що пов'язували євреїв совєтських у цьому Союзі. Є навіть така анекдотична історія. Пітер попросив, я не можу не реагувати. Австралійське єврейство в Австралії традиційне, дуже схоже на британське єврейство. Ну, і, звичайно, бо воно з корені звідси. Воно останні 30 років дивляться на хвилі імміграції з усього світу в Австралію. Єврейської імміграції. І вони виділяють три групи євреїв. Дві з них вони не сприймають як євреїв взагалі, а одну кажуть так, це щось таке, що нам схоже на нас. Хто це? Я не буду... Тут загадками казати, я зразу скажу, совєтських євреїв, австралійські євреї не сприймають взагалі як євреїв, бо вони майже нічого не знають своєї історії. Я кажу про совєтські часи до 91-го року. Друге, вони не сприймають як євреїв Ізраїль, бо це нова ідентичність ізраїльська, яка дуже відрізняється від ідентичності британських євреїв, від ідентичності американських євреїв. Є навіть соціологічне дослідження в 90-ті роки Ліббана і Коїна, яке показує, що це дві різних ідентичності, два різних народи, хоч і ті, і ті вважають себе євреями. І нарешті третє – це євреї Південної Африки, які попадали в Австралію. Їх вони вважають. Таким чином, 
В чині сьогодні бачать в світі три типи ідентичності єврейської. Це західноєвропейська, до якої відноситься і американська, канадська, єврейська і австралійська ідентичності, східноєвропейська, східна Європа і країни колишнього Совєтського Союзу і Ізраїльська. І тільки в 91-му році у нас з'явилася можливість навчати своїх дітей. Ми почали відкривати школи, ми почали займатися вихованням, ми почали повертати традицію, відбудовувати синагоги. І це все робилося вже в незалежній Україні. Я не можу сказати, що держава нам дуже допомагала, але вона не заважала. Все, на що нам вистачало своя енергія, я приймав участь ще з 80-х років, як тільки звільнився в відродження відновлення єврейського життя. Ми зробили все, на що у нас вистачало енергії, грошей і професіоналізму. І нам ніхто не заважає це робити досі. Але для мене поворотними точками є майдани. Чому? Насправді вони не є поворотними. Справа в тому, що ідентичність змінюється еволюційно, поступово. Блаженіший Любомир Гузар, кардинал Гузар, Греко-католицька сказав, дайте людям вирости у свободі. З 91-го року і українці, і меншини, і, зокрема, євреї в Україні живуть у свободі. І вони формують самі своє життя. І це дуже важливий чинник. І саме це повернуло. Ті накопичення цих нових рис ідентичності дало те, що євреї перейняли участь у Майдані 2004 року. Але небагато їх було. В 13-му році вже було їх більше. Таким чином в мене народилася формула певна, що совєтські євреї, євреї України у проміжний етап 90-ті роки і українські євреї, яких тепер стає все більше і більше. Їх питома вага з часом збільшується українських євреїв. І це і є модернізація цієї політичної нації. Що їх об'єднує з українцями? Вони разом будують державу, разом будують політичну націю і ця спільна робота є тим, що їх пов'язує. Але одночасно в суспільству є і совєтські євреї, і євреї України, які ще не визначилися, і українські євреї. І в мене більш близькі, я більш близький до українських, кримських татар, які разом з нами відбудовують Україну, демократію, свободу, ніж з тими євреями, які залишилися совєтські. Хоч ми з ними одні по етнічних ознаках і навіть по релігійних. Ось така дивна робота. Трансформація єврейської ідентичності у Україні. Дякую. Марк, я хочу сказати щось, що Осик зачинив там, перед тим, як ми повернемо в інші Україні. Це питання діаспори через цю чарну анекдоту про австралійські джуди. Але чому є не є українські джуди в діаспорі? Я маю, російські джуди, так. Що є... Or even Soviet Jews. You know, I have relatives in Brighton Beach, and it's you know, there's a clear conception of Soviet Jew, Jews there. Well, it's exactly uh, what uh, Professor Hitchak uh, was talking about. Uh, it's only recently that the idea of um, Ukrainian quality actually became concrete in the world, so that there is a state to which people can uh, owe allegiance uh, prior to. Uh, the establishment of a real Ukrainian state because the uh, Ukrainian SSSR uh, is uh, not, um, not really a, a state that's uh, a figment uh, on paper. Uh, there was no polity. There were Ukrainians in the sense of uh, people who professed an ethnic Ukrainian nas uh, nationality, uh, uh, but uh, prior to the 20th century they often called themselves Ruthenes or Rusines rather than Ukrainians and there was no way that um, uh, Jewish people would identify themselves as belonging to that nationality and um, as they emigrated to a diaspora they would certainly not identify themselves uh, with, uh, uh, with that ethnic uh, group so uh, there was no real way um, to, to establish that sort of national identity Um, um, and if, if people did uh, remember uh, their homeland, uh, uh, in terms of Ukrainians, as uh, you mentioned in your introduction, it would be to remember the pogroms, 
or at least to remember a story about the pogroms. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of remembering who they are, um, I always say if you go to North America, and I'm sure it's uh, the case uh, in Britain as well, and you ask uh, Jewish people where their family comes from, the answer will be Poland or Russia. Yeah. And the reality is that over half of the people whom you ask that question really have ancestors who come from the territory of modern day Ukraine. They either come from Galicia or they come from uh, the Pale of Settlement. Uh, Galicia was um, uh, assimilated into Poland and uh, the Pale of Settlement was ruled by, uh, uh, by Russia until uh, after the, uh, uh, the Second World War. So that's where the imagination of the diaspora still exists. And of course, uh, our history is, is quite unique because uh, for uh, linguistic reasons, we're still back uh, 500 years ago uh, with the Commonwealth of Poland and Lithuania. So people are uh, either Galiciana or they're uh, Litvaks. Uh, and so, so, so hold on, hold on, hold on. You're telling me JFS, JW3, New London Synagogue, all these institutions where people think they're Russian or Polish Jews and they're actually Ukrainian Jews. Most of actually, them are. Mo most of North London are Ukrainian Jews. Uh, if you're looking at... Uh, I'm not talking about St. John's politics. Wood, that's different. Yeah, that's yeah. different. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're Ukrainian Jews if you're going to look at modern day, a modern-day map. But, of course, somebody, say, who was born in Munkac would tell you that's ridiculous. Don't look at a modern-day map because somebody who had been born in Munkac at the turn of the century could, within his lifetime, uh, be a citizen of Austria-Hungary, of, um, I guess, uh, uh, Russia, uh, Slo uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, Slo uh, Slo uh, Ukraine, Slo uh, Slovak Republic, Hungary, who knows? Uh, you would know b better, but at least five or six different uh, uh, countries. Uh, the map keeps moving, and people have to keep up with it. And, uh, the Jews have to learn each language uh, in succession, uh, in order to keep up with it. Yaroslav, is, coming back to the present day, is Ukraine an anti-Semitic country? In the sense that what does the polling tell us? And how can we even try measuring this? Because it's certainly something that, that, that creeps up in the media quite a lot. I think how to answer this question, to be, in a sense, yes. In a sense that every country is anti-Semitic. In this sense, yes. A most unfortunately, anti-Semitism is a global phenomenon, and uh, whatever country you pick up, so there is some kind of anti-Semitism. The real question is to what extent the country is anti-Semitic. So what I would answer the sense that Ukraine is increasingly less and less and less and less anti-Semitic. Uh, there are some uh, uh, objective measures like a Bogardo scale, if you know what I mean, there's uh, the scale the social, social, social scientists use that measures the distance to different ethnic groups, various ethnic groups, and also some groups like homosexuals, because they're even much more alienated than the other group. So let me put this way, that on this scale, Jews are, has the same more positions like Poles and Canadians, which means neither positive nor negative, rather positive than negative. The most negative groups are Arabs, as strange as it sounds, are there any Arabs in Ukraine? It's exactly Arabs, because it, Arabs is mixed with Muslims. And since Muslims are very much uh, uh, taken as a point of the uh, anti uh, uh, terrorism, put it differently. <clears throat> uh, let me finish this way. So the most uh, hated group or alienated group are Romas, uh, Arabs, and homosexuals. And the most closest group are the Ukrainian-speaking Ukrainians and Russian-speaking Ukrainians and Belarusians. That's it. So the you, you, you Jews are some, sometime in the middle. If also has some kind of comparison with other countries, uh, uh, surprising as it is, as it sounds, as it looks, Ukraine has a very positive tendency in a sense that Ukraine feel much closer to Jews than, say, Poland, than Poland and Russia and other countries. You could, do, you could Google Pew. This is the famous, uh, famous international sociological firm who did this study recently, which shows that actually Ukraine, anti-Semitism, presents Ukraine in a very much attractive, attractive light. It doesn't mean to say there's no anti-Semitism in Ukraine. There's, there is anti-Semitism in Ukraine, but they have locate who is this anti-Semites and what kind of rhetoric they use and for what purpose they use. 
so to say. But basically, I will say so, if I may end somewhere, if Ukraine would be better of country, if Ukraine would have a better standards of life, more stability, and there is no war, I believe that many Jews would consider this country as a potential place to live, because they're much more secure and much more comfortable than living in other countries. So this probably will be the, the shortest answer to this question. Osik, I think for the first time or in recent memory, we see the entry of Jewish political figures very actively into the politics of the country. Is, is the Jewish, is ex, you know, the prime minister is Jewish. How is that treated inside the political discourse by journalists, by the political establishment? Um, are they treated as Jewish politicians or how, how is this framed? Якщо торкатися Володимира Гройсмана, то його більше сприймають не як політика, а як менеджера, як адміністратора, бо він прем'єр-міністр, а він не в парламенті, він не є президентом. Але я хочу про інше. Єдине, можливо, з небагатьох питань, де я відчуваю себе майже професіоналом, це якраз питання моніторингу і аналізу антисемітизму. Бо я займаюся цим 30 років, будую різні мережі ще з часів Совєтського Союзу, які досліджують це явище на цій території. І я знаю також ситуацію в світі, я навіть знаю ситуацію в Великій Британії. Я не знаю, чи багато серед вас є, серед присутніх тих, хто знає, скільки антисемітських інцидентів на рік відбувається в Британії. Хтось знає це? Я знаю. 600 інцидентів. Порядок 600. Так ось. Ярослав прав, що антисемітизм є усюди. Питання в тому, який він. Наприклад, після 91-го року, я вже казав, в Україні відсутній державний антисемітизм. Нема жодного елементу державної політики, яка би прямо була спрямована проти євреїв. Те визначення, яке в Європі сприйняли під антисемітизмом, обов'язково передбачає присутність або в інциденті, в висловах, обов'язково ненависті до євреїв. Так ось, треба розподіляти це і розуміти, що є міжнародна класифікація. Вона фіксує певні прояви, є європейські інституції, яким цим займаються, і в Західній Європі найбільше це Німеччина. Там на рік відбувається близько двох тисяч антисемітських інцидентів. Що називається антисемітським інцидентом? Це або напад, фізичний напад на ґрунті антисемітизму, ненависті, або акт вандалізму проти єврейської власності, або надписи на стінах графіті, свастики і таке інше. На єврейських об'єктах, можливо, на приватних, або на общинах, на синагогах і таке інше. Так ось, це є інциденти. Є ще, крім Hate crimes є ще hate speech, вислови. Вони фіксуються окремо. І дуже непрофесійно, коли це звалюється все в одну купу і рахується разом. Треба розподіляти і порівнювати окремі складові. Так ось, в Україні за останні роки, а ми їх фіксуємо, ці параметри, дуже ретельно, у нас працює один з найкращих в Східній Європі фахівців по моніторингу і аналізу проїв антисемітизму, я звуть В'ячеслав Ліхачов, кожен рік він видає репорт, ось за 17-й рік, і вже готовий за 18-й рік, і ми знаємо, скільки інцидентів в Україні, скільки випадків вандалізму антисемітського в Україні, і вони, повірте, набагато менше, ніж в Західній Європі, навіть менше, ніж в Чехії, бо в Чехії їх близько 200 за рік. В Україні, ось в останньому році, в 18-му, як і в 17-му, не було жодного нападу на ґрунті антисемітизму. Жодного фізичного нападу. З усієї відповідальності я вам про це говорю. Жодний експерт в світі, ані з Канади, ані з Америки, не може додати до нашого моніторингу жодного інцидента. Це дуже професійно відповідальний і чесний моніторинг. Ми не хочемо применшати, ми не хочемо перебільшувати прояви антисемітизму в Україні. Що стосується вандалізму, у нас в минулому році було 12 випадків 
антисемітського вандалізму. Таким чином, загалом, це все одно 12, бо не було нападів. 12 і 600. 12 і 800 у Франції, 12 і 2 тисячі в Німеччині, 12 і 200 в Чехії. Ось картина антисемітизму в Україні. Він є, але він дуже низького рівня. І справа тут, можливо, не зовсім і в Україні. Справа в континентальних різних чинниках. Справа в тому, що антисемітизм в Східній Європі суттєво відрізняється від антисемітизму в Західній Європі. В Західній Європі присутні два потужних чинника, які визначають антисемітизм тут. Перше – це радикальне крило ісламської діаспори, яка робить основні напади, основні графіці, основні випадки вандалізму. Але друге – це цікавіше, другий чинник. Це дуже модно в колах лівої інтелігенції, ліберальної, гіпертрофія порушень прав людини. З цього виростає антиізраїльська діаспора, Налаштованість цих лівих кругов, ви знаєте, як ліві, навіть в Британії ліберісти зараз налаштовані проти Ізраїлю. І через таку витіснення, через таку сублімацію антиізраїльська переходить в антисемітську. Ми, євреї, сприймемо однаково. Для нас антиізраїльська позиція – це антисемітська. І тут у нас двох думок нема навколо цього. Цих двох чинників потужних, ані ліберального гіпертрофірованого відношення, ані ісламського радикального екстремізму, нема. В Східній Європі їх нема. Тому я єдине, в чому не погоджуюсь з паном Ярославом, що якщо стане рівень життя вищий в Україні, наша країна стане приваблива для мігрантів, особливо з Арабського Сходу. І з'явиться ісламський чинник, який також може дати нам збільшення антисемітських випадків. Що стосується українського вкладу, він мінімальний. І я вірю, що так буде і далі. Я був тапто на мій голові від різних людей. Дуже брифно на цьому суб'єкті. Я хочу почати, бо наш час вирішує, і ми маємо вирішувати 1000 років історії, і навіть 5 чи 6 вирішувати на політичному спектру. Але, Марк. Just briefly, first of all, I'm obviously here under false pretenses. Uh, the closest I ever got to serving time in prison was in 1967 when I uh, naively drove a rented car um, across East Germany trying to cross into West Berlin in a rented car with We Stand by Israel plastered across the windows and was invited to uh, step into a room uh, plastered with pictures of the Leipzig Trade Fair of 1953 and thought I was about to be shocked. Uh, and uh, although I did for a time teach uh, at a university and I do uh, by accident hold a PhD, it was in English literature, which will not help me tonight. But I was for a time again by accident and by a mistake uh, appointed Deputy Attorney General for the province of Ontario, so I know a little bit about hate literature and about the prosecution of hate literature. So I'd, I'd like to think about uh, the concept of anti-Semitism um, slightly differently. Um, it seems to me that um, we've been talking about the idea of a new Ukraine and the opening up of Ukrainian nationhood and a feeling of belonging in a way that unfortunately resembles the Whig view of history, the inevitable triumph of liberalism. And Jews traditionally have been attracted to a liberal opening and the idea of a pluralistic state, uh, a meritocracy where everyone is accepted on the basis of uh, their talents, and not on the basis of who they are. That's one view, and that's our view of the new Ukraine, why UJE is uh, in existence, to bring about a dialogue between Ukrainians and Jews based on a realistic view of their history and uh, a view of a new Ukraine. That's one view. There's another view that is based on the very ethnic um, uh, definitions that in the past, as Professor Hrytiak said, excluded Jews from the definition of Ukraine. 
just as it excluded Jews from the definition of who's a Czech, the definition of who's a Hungarian, the definition of who's a Bulgarian, uh, all through that region. I'm not confident that the final struggle over what it means to be a Ukrainian has taken place yet. It's certainly uh, all over the world that struggle is still taking place. Um, and to me, anti-Semitism in Ukraine is associated with an atavistic nationalism, with the right-wing form of anti-Semitism, not the left-wing form that uh, 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 Mr. Zissels has rightly um, talked about, which is not uh, uh, present in Ukraine, but it is very much rooted in the Second World War and in the run-up to the Second World War, which nobody on the panel has talked about, but Ukrainian anti-Semitism in its most virulent form, which I think still exists in some places, and we have to talk about it realistically, is based on a warped anti-communism that identifies Jews with Judeo-Bolshevism and says that communism is Jewish. Uh, and that has not disappeared yet, and that's one of the areas where one has to uh, confront the anti-Semitism and one has to continue the struggle. We're actually going to get into that for the meat of our discussion, but you raised an important point here, which is about Ukraine and to what extent it's imagining its future as a political Ukrainian community or as an ethnic one. I mean, in my understanding, I've met personally after the Maidan or during the Maidan, I, I met people who advertised the idea of an ethnic Ukrainian state. They actually believed, they were from the right sector, and they believed that uh, there was a Ukrainian chromosome that had developed there from Paleolithic times because the people who lived there had fought mammoths and they had a special heroic spirit which had been passed on. Their best friends were Russian Nazis who also believed in a Russian chromosome. They wanted to bring together all the different fascist movements, la 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 la. During the Maidan, we were incredibly alarmed by these people. They then got under 1% in the elections. Uh, they had one glamorous guy who became a deputy. And, I mean, but how strong is this idea of an ethnic Ukrainian future in Ukrainian politics? Is it something we should be scared of, or are we actually by... We ended up writing so many articles about these people in the uh, Western Jewish press that um, we kind of like started getting scared of them, and then the election happened, and we were like, oh my God, we've been writing about freaks. Yeah. You look in my direction. So no, I look, in, I look... I, I <laughs> look... Your fruit, sorry. <laughs> There is a danger, without a doubt. This is danger which is constant there. Uh, there's no denying. And uh, what exactly what the question answers to, to Josip, and I want to also to add to this question. Uh, there is a recently a new uh, tema, a new topic, whatever you say, in Ukrainian public discourse, that Ukraine is uh, ruled by, by Jews. They even call it worse, Jewish yoke over Ukraine. And this is directly related to Poroshenko, the president, Groisman, the prime minister, several ministers who are Jewish origins, uh, or, or they presume to be of Jewish origin, and also including Yulia Tomoshenko, who also believed to be a Jew. Typical. Oh, typical Jew of Armenian origin. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the story goes, the story goes, and which is, uh, went around by the Ukrainian nationalist of this exactly, of this milieu which uh, Peter was referring, that actually Ukraine is never ruled by the Jews, and this is kind of Semitic, the Semitic plot, uh, uh, say, uh, uh, made by, by Soros, all the kind, kind, kind of things. So there's the new topics there. And the uh, irony is that all the main candidates for next, next presidential elections, we have this in March, they're all either Jews or presumed to be Jews. <laughs> so this gives you an idea about the, the new reality in Ukraine, the importance of the Jewish issue, Jewish identity, and emerges this identity. So this is kind of the story which is probably not quite serious, but serious, even, so it, it's, even so it's not quite serious, it should be taken very, very seriously. But also very important, another part of the story, that this is exactly one of the rhetorics that was used intentionally and very kind of the persistently by the leaders of the separatist Donbass. Because they believe they fight not against Ukraine, they fight against the Masons. 
by the Shidam Sonra and by Soros, by Rothschild, other kind of things. And they exactly used the example of the Poroshenko as a supposedly Waltzman, uh, Groysman, all the kind, kind, kind of things. So this is, this is another. What I'm saying, what exactly this line which was supposed to be proposed by, 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 by Peter. Even so, they hate each other. In many sense, Ukraine and Russia is nationalists, they're very similar because they have the similar line of arguments because they believe that Ukraine are ruled by Jews. That said, that said, so exactly this is, uh, I would refer here to the point of the uh, Lichachov, which I believe the perfect expert, and this is what, what this was referring to. He made this very important point, that even so we have this kind of the event uh, phenomenon in Ukraine, we have it everywhere in this region, without a doubt. <laughs> Wonder if it won't be such a phenomenon in this country, given the, the, the history and the political circumstances. There is a one crucial difference between Ukrainian nationalists, Russian nationalists, Polish nationalist, Hungarian nationalist, like that. they never get more than 1% of the voting. And this is a bit of a crucial difference. If this could be not neglected, no, it's not neglected because they could always get more in percent that says. But this is the real state is now, but nowadays, that they have this kind of very marginal position. They most likely, not the most likely, it's definitely, they wouldn't have no chance on presidential elections. No one in this election will be there. They will get even more than 10 percent, I believe, less than that. They probably have some chance of the parliament election. Let's, let's wait and see. But even so, I would get this, the chances as not. So basically, this is, I would say this, if I may conclude somewhere, we had a lot of verbal antisemitism, verbal violence, but not kind of physical violence on political violence. And I believe the still trend is rather stable, and the trend is still less and less ethnic, more and more civic nation. I want to move on because, you know, this is a potential problem, but overall, the, the, you know, the movement, if we look at it in historical, in the historical content is, cl is, is clearly positive. But where it does get interesting and what is a mainstream debate is how a country, a new country like Ukraine, still tries to make sense of its history. And its history is deeply fractured in the sense that I don't want to drag people into sort of like the more uh, sort of complex and uh, uh, occult bits of this debate. It's a very, you know, it's a very, it's, it's a very um, uh, virulent debate in, in Ukraine and among people who are experts of Ukraine. But I'm oversimplifying here. One person Ukrainian freedom fighter during the Second World War is another person's um, anti-Semite who wants to clear Ukraine from... Jews, or who want an ethnically pure Ukraine. I mean, I think we have very similar problems in our history here. Certainly, in all our history and how we think about Northern Ireland, we have this problem all the time. Are Sinn Féin heroes, or are they, are they just terrorists? And virtually all national liberation movements, I think anywhere in the world, have this paradox. In Britain, of course, we have the much deeper paradox that we've never dealt with, is how do we deal with our colonial history? How do we teach history in a classroom where there are Indian kids and English kids who oppress the Indian kids' grandparents? And largely, we just don't talk about it. Um, so how is Ukraine dealing with this? Because there, you know, there is a wave of statues going up. And so sometimes they see posts going, oh my god, you know, a statue has gone up to a, someone who is genuinely a Ukrainian freedom fighter. But you then look at their statements about Jews, and they're pretty appalling. So how do we even approach this? And I don't want to, I think we should embrace the issue in its complexity, because I, I, I think it's, um, it's one, what, what, it, one, it doesn't help to whitewash either way. I mean, Yaris, even on the level of tuition in schools uh, and what's taught at universities and in schools and in terms of national memory, how, how is this playing out and what could be the way forward? Uh, Ukraine situation is hardly unique. You could hardly find a country which is not divided on many issues of its own history. Ukraine is probably more divided than other country, but still, still there are some points which are united the country, and therefore the historical narratives is built around this kind of figure that could unite the country, so to say. And definitely there is kind of historical uh, figures that comes from the pre 19th pre 20th century, like uh, Kiev, Kiev, Kiev and Kings, uh, Khmelnytsky, by the way, uh, the, uh, the, the national poets, uh, Shevchenko, which is very much like a Russian Pushkin on Polish Mitzkevich, and uh, historical sp sporty figures, rock, rock, rock figures, all the kind of things, they are there. They are there. And therefore, you could build some kind of narrative. 
that narrative. But there is one thing I believe is very important here. Once you bring the issue of this national fighter, you immediately got, got dividing effect. If you want to see Ukrainians divided, start talking about Bandera. Do we know who Bandera is? For, for the non-Ukrainian experts, Bandera was one of the leaders of the uh, Ukrainian national movement, first against the Nazis, then against the Soviets. By 41, he was in a German concentration camp. Yeah. But interestingly, he then became a figure of kind of either adoration by some Ukrainian nationalists, a sort of a bogeyman in Soviet propaganda, and now increasingly one of these very divisive nationalists. There, there, is, there is hardly a Ukrainian figure that had such cut international fame recently than Bandera. Because this figure, which is, the, which is discussed in Ukraine, Russia, Poland, Germany, Israel, and Northern America. He also right killed a lot of Poles. Yeah, but it was, without a doubt. He, was, he didn't kill it himself because it was concentration camps, but the movement, which was bear his name, Baderivci, they did a kind of very much atrocities, which could be in, probably even said a genocide against the Poles. So he was the many, many, many men of the records. So the point is, if you want to see Ukrainian divide, they start talking about Bandera. Quite of a sudden, have a two different types of attitudes which could be hardly reconciled. And this is true, and this is the problem which we're dealing with. But if you want to see Ukrainians united, start talking about Stalin. Quite of a sudden, Stalin unites Ukraine as an anti hero. And has an explanation because nowadays, more and more, the, the symbol of the famine, of the Holodomor, becomes extremely important. And since many Ukrainian families have this memory, as a personal memory, which has forbidden the Soviet Union, now with this historical memory, which officially resonates with the personal stories, and with you, Russians see you, Stalin as a nation builder, as one who rose the Russia from the so of the from the benign state to the world power, who fought against Nazis, all the kind of things. There is nothing such of this meanings in Ukrainian case, because in Ukrainian's case, Stalin is always in the fight with the famine and the, with the repression. So I'm saying here, the, the, without a doubt, there is dividing things, but there is something which is united there. Uh, how could it be reconciled? What I'm trying to say here, it's an important point. Ukraine has many problems. They have problems with reconciliation with Jews. They have problems with reconciliation with Poles. But believe me, they have much more problems with reconciliation between them, themselves. The major problem is Ukraine Ukraine reconciliation. Especially nowadays, since the Ukraine has been a civic, 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 civic nation. So my answer would be, there were several, since the Ukrainian situation is not unique, there were several recipes how to reconcile the, this kind of the narratives. I wouldn't go that far because there's a lot of literature about the things, please. But first of all, you should say history clearly and describe the fact clearly and says, yes, Bandera was a hero, but he's responsible for many atrocities and kind of things. So this is basically the most responsible answer to this question. Probably, yeah. So this is basically, and this is what liberal historian says, basically, the message, yeah. We should accept Bandera. We could not neglect Bandera because, let's face it, he was a hero in a sense that many heroes is very close to the bandits because this, 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 <laughs> the difference is very <laughs> slim, so to say. We know this, this story. But let's face it, he was a hero, but he was responsible. And this must be clearly said. But also the other story is, if you want to have this kind of the reconciliation, don't talk, don't, talk the, don't talk big stories. Don't talk ideologies. Talk simple stories. Stories that people from, from below, the complicated stories, how to manage to survive, how they betray each other, how they help each other. Because this is the most important point of reconciliation. It's not unique again. It has been did everything. And what helps Ukraine nowadays since? Because Ukraine nowadays is in the war. And people know the complicated story. And since they know their own complicated story, they could resonate with the story of the past. The Donetsk was that much simple. And this, I believe, one of the, I'm not saying Ukrainians are doing that only. There's one thing about the important of Ukraine, it's very good of Ukraine. There is no single narrative. There is no dominant narrative. It's a beauty of the country. There is no monopoly. There are several narratives. Some of them competitive with each other, some that could be consistent with each other. So actually, teachers could pick up whatever he or she, she, uh, she, she wants. And basically what I'm saying here, that there are some attempts to write good historical books along these lines. But they will be successful, I don't know, but at least we have to give them a try and credit of the, so say, that this might work. Osik, you, you work with this 
very closely, um, both in your communication with other minorities and with, you know, the Ukrainian authorities. How, how do you see this, this coming together? Do, do, do you think Ukraine will be able to have these sort of competing narratives at the same time? Про реальний антисемітизм я вже розповідав. Але крім реального є міфічний. Є багато міфів і легенд, які сьогодні передусім об'єднуються російською пропагандою. І крім того, що сказав пан Ярослав про одну з, одну з розголожень тої пропаганди російської, що владу в, Єв... в Україні захопили євреї, що це масонська масонський заколот, і це загорожує. Але ця пропаганда спрямована на, молоде, на молоду генерацію. Але є і інше розголудження, більш потужне, що в Україні до влади прийшли фашисти, ультранаціоналісти, і вони погрожують всьому, і демократії, і євреям, і всім іншим національним чином. І треба розділяти міфи від реальності. Героїзація колабораціоністів або героїзація катів – це один з міфів, який майже не має під собою ніякої реальності. Для мене тут взагалі, як для українського єврея, дуже просто. Істота, яка з зброєю в руках грабує, гвалтує, вбиває – це є злочинець. І нема сро... терміну давнини. Навіть через 80 років такого треба судити. Бо він застосовував зрою проти мирного населення. В той же час людина, яка зі зброєю в руках, захищає свою родину, свій дім, своє село, свою державу від іноземних окупантів, це є захисник і, скоріше, герой. І це треба розділяти. Я кажу так, що ані Бендера, ані Шухевич не є моїми власними героями, бо я єврей, і в мене є родова пам'ять. Але я розумію, чому для половини українців вони герої. Вони загинули за незалежність України. І цього вже достатньо. Я не думаю, що є люди в Україні, половини, які прославляють цих героїв за те, що вони нібито вбивали євреїв, чи погано до них. Взагалі про це ніхто не думає. Вони загинули за Україну, і цього достатньо. І не герої поєднують, я згоден з паном Ярославом, нас поєднує з українцями і з іншими наше спільне майбутнє. Де є демократія, де є незалежність від російської нової імперії, де нема антисемітизму, нема ксенофобії і є стійкий економічний розвиток. Це нас об'єднує з усіма і меншинами, і з більшістю українців, хоча Україна розділена і не по, ці, не по національній ознаці, а скоріше між Заходом і Сходом, між Євразією і Європою. І те, що зараз коїться на Донбасі, де воюють представники різних етнічних груп. І росіяни воюють з української сторони, і євреї воюють з української сторони. Так само, як на Майдані першим загинув вірменин, потім білорус, і серед сотні небесної були три людини з єврейського походження. Ось що об'єднує спільне майбутнє України. А ті, хто проросійські, вони є в кожній етнічній групі. І в українській, і в єврейській, і в будь-якій іншій. Але це наше минуле. Оця Небесна Сотня розділила історію України на незворотній. Минуле від майбутнього, авторитарне від демократичного. І я сподіваюся, що це все позаду. Бо я знаю про 2,5 тисяч українців, які рятували євреїв під час Холокосту. І я хочу в Україні, де живуть нащадки цих людей – а не нащадки тих негідників, які допомагали видавати і вбивати євреїв. 
So I'm quite keen to get into questions because uh, we have until 9 o'clock. Is that right? Is that my time frame? Do you have something you want to... I don't want to censor. Uh, so, I mean, if, are there any questions? If not, I'll ask them, but maybe some people will have some. Uh, okay, why don't we take them in bunches? Um, so uh, let's do them in... Uh, don't be scared. Okay, let's move from the back down. There's the one right at the back, and then we'll take sort of yeah, two or three going down. Yeah, microphone. We should, we'll just wait for the microphone to come to you. Uh, and if you can, very briefly, in, introduce yourself. Uh, my name is uh, Bernard Herman. I have been to Ukraine, but I have no specialist knowledge of the subject or the place. My question is, firstly, how many Jews are living in Ukraine? And secondly... Is there a difference in Ukrainian Jewish identity between those living in the west of the country, in the old Habsburg part, and those living in the east of the country who usually look towards Russia? I'm uh, just a little intrigued by the uh, change of title. And it's certainly relevant to Ukrainian sensitivities, although not specifically to Jewish ones. Uh, Jews in the new, the new Ukraine becomes Jews and new Ukraine. Now, I do understand the sensitivity over the definite article in terms of the phrase the Ukraine, because of this association of the word Krai, which suggests that Ukraine is a territory on the edge of Russia. However, to say the new, the new Ukraine is absolutely not the same as saying the Ukraine. For example, you could say Jews and the new Germany, which is not to suggest that there's a territory called the Germany. That's all. Thank you. Good, good evening. My name is Mike Crabb. I'm twofold question. I'm firstly a member of the Northwood and Pier Liberal Synagogue, and we have actually twinned with the Tevar congregation in Lvov, and we went there back in June. And there's a, a gradually a progressive congregation arising there. And secondly, I do have a family um, connection with that, with that place because my father-in-law, who's still very much alive in Suffolk, is 93, and at the time was a guest of Stalin in Kazakhstan as a result of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. But two questions I wanted to ask, uh, ask you, and you haven't mentioned it yet, is... The stranglehold that Russia has on the Ukraine, particularly in with relationship to energy supplies, when at the moment, you know, they supply so much of the natural gas, they've now confiscated the part round the Donbass, and as a result of that, coal production has been halved. And while I was in Ukraine back in June, having to go to people's houses which are freezing cold in minus 30 degrees centigrade. And I wanted to know what the Ukrainian government is actually doing about energy conservation in that country. Thank you very much. Uh, take a couple more. Я українською там запитання для різноманітності. Пане Зісельс і пане Грицак, за кого будете голосувати на виборах президента України? Я не почув. За кого будете голосувати на виборах президента України? Okay, well, a Jew, definitely, we know that. <laughs> or someone thought to be a Jew. <laughs> no, we've decided that Tibishenko is Jewish now, so that pretty much narrows the field. Take one more, and then, and then we'll, we'll do them in a bundle. Hello, my name is Katarina Tirsen. I'm a member of the Communist League. That's why I went to Maidan um, and actually visited there and I agree the right sector might be visible but the number of people that we talked to over there there were certainly a broad sector of the working class or the working people who did Maidan and I think it's very encouraging that you all of you re you, you refer that to a turning point because I think that is how history is made in massive popular mobilizations that's how you build unity and that's, that, I think that, that is very, very important. And, um, you know, I, I also think it's very important to keep an eye what is happening to anti-Semitism in the world, including in Ukraine, which is another reason why we went there. 
Uh, and I want to, I think it's important to point out this liberal anti-Semitism that is growing um, very much in this country. And my question is, first I want to say, you know, the future is mobilization of the working class. That's my opinion, uh, which you might have guessed. But this ideological anti-Semitism, that's my question, isn't that a danger and how could that develop if, you know, for some, you know, because of what's happening in the world, you will have more immigration into Ukraine. Uh, you, don't we need to really deal with that as well, <laughs> as some of you have been pointed out? Thank you. Okay, so let's, let's start tackling those. Um, how many Jews are there in Ukraine, actually? That's a, really, that's a question for Osik, I think. And are the Jews in the Austro-Hungarian Jews? Are they different to the, to the rest, I guess? I mean, I'm not sure where the Austro-Hungarian Jews end, really. Uh, 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 Дивіться, є як найменше три визначення, за якими демографи рахують євреїв. Перше це перепис населення. Якщо б сьогодні відбувся в Україні перепис населення, то приблизно 70 тисяч громадян України назвали б себе євреями. Друге, друге визначення це релігійне, галахічне у кого мати єврейка, або хто прийняв юдаїзм як релігію. Якщо порахувати, то таких буде 150 тисяч. Є закон про повернення ізраїльський, відповідно до якого людина може потрапити і отримати громадянство Ізраїлю. Таких людей сьогодні в Україні 350 тисяч. Я не знаю, що я відповів на ваше питання. And there was a second part of the question. Да. Is the, um, Чи є різниця uh, в ідентичності? Так, yeah. is Jewish identity different да. in the West and the East? Так, да. я, я спробував uh, говорити, коли говорив про ідентичність, що ідентичність меншини національної Дуже залежить від ідентичності оточуючого соціуму. Певною мірою меншина слідує за розвитком ідентичності великого соціуму. І оскільки у нас на Західній Україні і українці трохи інші, ніж на Східній, то відповідно і євреї також відрізняються. Євреї Західної України, вони, можна сказати, якщо спростити, вони більше українські євреї, ніж східні. Це... І я вже одразу сп... стосовно неправильної назви української євреї. Це прийнята назва. Є британські євреї, є французькі євреї, є німецькі євреї, угорські, румунські. І є зараз українські євреї. Це результат розвитку ідентичності за останні 200 років. І Україна, чим більше вона стає європейською країною, хоч до цього ще далеко, тим більше в ній буде саме українських євреїв. І також, while, while we have you, who's going who's to win the presidential elections? Ну, я не політолог, але для мене не це важливо. Для мене, важ... для мене важливо, що хто б не прийшов в президенти України, ну, з першої п'ятірки кандидатів, я впевнений, це моє суб'єктивне переконання, ніхто вже не поверне Україну назад до Російської імперії нової. Навіть якщо це буде більше проросійський кандидат, над кожним з президентів буде висіти кошмар Майдану. Бо двічі за останні 15 років спроби повернути Україну на Схід стикалися з новою українською ідентичністю, яка виводила мільйони людей на Майдани. 
І така пасіонарність може знести будь-кого. Якщо вона знесла Януковича, то тим більш вона знесе будь-кого, хто буде намагатися повернути нас у минуле, в авторитарну систему і в Російську імперію. Марк, це питання нового ідеологічного антисемітизму виникає. Um, we've, you, you mentioned the idea of sort of a, an ethnic nationalist one, mm -hmm. which would obviously have a potential very strong anti-Semitic turn. But what are, what are the other ways that, that, that anti-Semitism anti could return into, into the mainstream of political discourse? Well, I don't think uh, liberal anti-Semitism has a chance in Ukraine. Um, by any means. So it, it will be the atavistic uh, anti-Semitism that uh, Russian propaganda will tell you uh, has already uh, taken place and is already there. Uh, I, what, I about think what about kind of anti-capitalist populism? Yeah, Let's say there's more problems, the economy crashes yeah. much worse, the elites are all Jews, the bank, I mean that kind I, of stereotype. I, oh, I, I think that uh, that is uh, a grave danger, but I think it's the same danger that uh, we face throughout Europe and throughout North America. We're seeing it. Uh, we, we all assume, naively, I think, that, uh, uh, as Francis Fukuyama said, uh, we've come to the end of history. Uh, the world has unfolded the way it should, and we've come to uh, liberal democracy as uh, uh, the final stage in the evolution of our politics, and uh, we'll live happily ever after. Um, but the 21st century is showing us that that's not necessarily the case, and we have to fight for uh, uh, liberal democracy if we uh, believe in it. Uh, and uh, the, we are very much uh, in, in a situation in uh, most uh, Western uh, democracies where uh, these sorts of uh, forces are there to be exploited uh, by unscrupulous politicians uh, who uh, should know better but don't. And I think that, uh, yes, uh, from what I've seen, and again, I'm here under false pretenses. I'm no expert in any of these areas, but anecdotally and from what I experience, uh, there's a lot of this going around, and I hear all the same things that uh, Professor Hitchak uh, talks about. I hear about the Jewish yoke. Uh, people in... Uh, uh, the areas that I go to assume I don't understand any Ukrainians, so they uh, uh, feel free to say whatever's on their mind uh, to my face, which is kind of a, a privilege that I have. So I hear a lot of things. And again, I do not believe Ukraine is anti-Semitic. I do not believe Ukrainians are anti-Semitic. Um, but I do believe that there is a subterranean anti-Semitism uh, in a lot of places, and I do believe that it's... Uh, it's rife for exploitation, and that there are people uh, who are willing to exploit it. Osik, sorry, you wanted to say something. Так, ми ми дуже ретельно і уважно слідкуємо за всіми праворадикальними групами в Україні. Всі вони без виключення маргінальні групи. Жодна з них не представлена в парламенті, на відміну від Західної Європи де багато праворадикальних партій є в парламентах. Я вважаю, що наше громадянське суспільство більшою мірою, меншою держава, контролює ситуацію з активністю праворадикальних груп. Я вам можу назвати їх назви, але я впевнений, що ви майже нікого з них не чули взагалі. Це тільки фахівці в них розбираються. На виборах 2014 року президентську Было два праворадикальных кандидата. Олег Тягнебок от партии «Свобода» и Дмитро Ярош от того правого сектора, который згадувався. Они разом набрали меньше 2%. А один еврейский кандидат Рабинович набрал больше, чем они обидва. 2,25%. Про что мы говорим? Есть правые радикали. Але вони дуже мізерні за впливом. Це не мейнстрим українського життя, праві радикали. Коли мене лякають правими радикалами, я скажу, я їх не боюся, а я боюся популістів. Кожний третій громадянин України 
відповідно до досліджень соціологічних, здатен проголосувати за популістів. І це більша загроза для України, ніж праві радикали. Тим більше, що праві радикали, можливо, тимчасово, але засереджені зараз домінантно на одному ворогові, на Росії. І навіть ліві політологи, такі як Андреас Умланд, німецький політолог, вважає, що це виправдано, бо Росія веде агресивну війну проти України. Всі політологи, всі праві радикали, які ми знаємо, не ведуть антисемітської пропаганди. Можливо, тимчасово. Вони здатні, можливо, як в Західній Європі, також навантажувати свою ідеологію. Але я б не став надавати велике значення ідеології, особливо в нашій частині світу. В Україні, де політичне життя не ідеологічне. Це просто боротьба груп інтересів, корпоративних інтересів. There's also a very a question about um, energy, which I don't think anybody, any of us is actually qualified to answer, but if somebody wants to, I'd be happy to. I'm just sorry, I don't think it's the right... I mean, it's a super important question, and I know there's a lot of drives to, you know, change energy consumption in Ukraine. I just don't know anything about it. I'm not sure anyone here does. Should we take some more questions, just more trying to stick to this, you know, Ukrainian-Jewish theme that we're dedicated to this evening? Uh, this time we'll go from the bottom up. Is that a, what's easier for you? Is it easier for you bottom down? You don't mind? Sorry, I'm making you run around. Yeah? Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Thank you so much for a wonderful discussion. I'm myself from Kiev, and I'm, I'm both from of Jewish and Ukrainian background, so this is very interesting for me. Uh, as you have mentioned correctly, Ukraine was home to the most number of Jews some time ago, and obviously the scale of Holocaust on Ukrainian territory was huge. So is there now, I know there are a lot of grassroots projects to commemorate this and to actually bring awareness of this, but is there any support from the state to educate people and to actually make this, you know, make this topic important and uh, remembered in Ukraine? Okay, that's very important. A couple more? Oh, look, there's a whole, there's a whole row here. We don't have much time, so we're going to be fairly brutal with these, but... A uh, very brief question to Professor Hritsak, because he mentioned the problem with Bandera and heroization of Bandera. Uh, and obviously it's a contradiction of uh, new Ukraine and um, uh, new Ukrainian philosemitism and the uh, governmental policy of building new historical narrative I'm talking about the National the Institute of National Institute of Historical Memory, which is dominated just by Bandera, uh, UPA, and fully disregarding other parts of the um, uh, Ukrainian history of, let's say, um, uh, the whole period of Ukrainian People's Republic. Uh, how to put together these two things? Uh, new approach to jewelry, heroization of Bandera, state support of such heroization, the whole process which really reminded the experience of Croatia during the days of uh, President Franja Tujman and um, uh, heroization of Ustasha as a part of the nation building. I could have thought of some other examples but apart from Croatia, but okay. Yeah. Um, I'm, uh, I know Ukraine quite well. I've been working there for uh, many, many years. Um, I find the current developments encouraging, but I find on the other hand that speaking about um, the extent of anti-Semitism, only counting the percentages of um, uh, how many votes uh, um, anti-Semitic or radical right uh, dep um, uh, candidates got is a bit too narrow. Um, there is something like a, um, a hidden anti-Semitism which is very, very spread in the country and um, uh, which is part, a bit, part of the, sorry to say, part of the culture uh, even. Um, there is no taboo when it comes, for example, using um, anti-Semitic stereotypes. Um, they are everywhere and you can hear them everywhere. 
Um, there is uh, a lot of um, things going on um, in, in just in, in such discourses in, in the country. So I wonder, um, and there's the other thing is there's a very little um, knowledge about um, Jews in Ukraine. And I find the biggest danger uh, is actually ignorance and a lack, lack of empathy. A lack of empathy concerning uh, the suffering of Jews in one's own country. If one is not open, including uh, collaboration of one's own nation in the Holocaust, if that is not taught in schools, then you will never get really an understanding and you will never understand, you will never be uh, feel this empathy for a nation which has been living in your own territory. So I think education uh, is, is the crucial thing which is needed now in Ukraine, a new way of speaking about these things and being open about them. Okay. We really don't have much time, so, okay, let's take, I can unite those three questions into one question. Let's see if I can do that with the next three comments. They're all brilliant questions, by the way. I'm just going to have to, it's just a time thing. But I think there's some time afterwards you can come up and torture people and ask them questions. Yeah. Just to follow up quickly on this gentleman's point, if we allow ourselves to embrace Bandera as a national hero, how can we then deny Russians of the, their right to accept Stalin as their national hero? And I'm pretty sure Russians would use that for their uh, local propaganda and also elsewhere. So Stalin defeated Hitler, we don't care about the other stuff. That argument, <laughs> well, which still, you hear most of the time. Yeah, he was terrible, but he saved us from Don't Hitler. you think that's a bit of no, a, no. having a double standard? No, no, no I'm just asking, that's, but that's, that's the argument you mean. Just, you know, just wanted to bring that up. Okay, that's a very good question, yes. Uh, yep. Um, <clears throat> final question. Um, what's the future of Jews in Ukraine, good or bad, and the future of the country? So that's it. Okay. <laughs> Okay, two more, then I'm going to have to wrap this. Yes. Okay, I'll get a chance. Then. Um, thank you for your talk. I'm not going to be um, very long. Um, so I, I want to refer back to the clear of that talk. I, I think we have not succeeded in defining the Ukrainian Jewish identity over time. Uh, because um, the title New Ukraine was referred during the Doc Fest. Uh, as to the Ukraine of the 20s, and then the Ukraine after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Well, we jumped over the whole period of the Soviet Union. Um, as much as you um, argued that there could have been the Ukrainian Jewish identity during the 20s, and there is such as uh, um, Mr. Susan uh, has argued nowadays in Ukraine, what happened with the Ukrainian Jewish identity during the Soviet period. And I th I'm thinking uh, now um, of a case study uh, with the massive immigration of Jews straight after the collapse of the Soviet Union to Germany. Uh, I happen to have one of my best friends is the first generation German Jew, and I'm talking about her <laughs> as a German Jew, even though she wouldn't have ever referred mm. to herself as a German Jew. She would have uh, you know, talked of herself as a Jew. Um, I, I have family that came from Ukraine. Um, I would argue that, that, that um, during the Soviet period, um, well, we know that obviously of, of cases of suppression, but well, my, my question is then, what happened to the Ukrainian Jewish identity? Was there a case of the Ukrainian Jewish identity during the Soviet period? Or was it just Soviet Jewish identity or pure Jewish identity? Mm -hmm. that I, I wish we could do just a whole right. session on that. That's such a rich yeah. thing. But I'm going to give a quick answer. You were a Soviet Jew. That was the thing. And you, or you were Soviet Ukrainian. And they were kind of... That's, I think, is the very simple answer. Yeah. Yeah. So in your past, it was Soviet Jew yeah. or Soviet yeah. Ukrainian. Yeah. Well, I... They would have... Well, what would they refer to? Jews. I didn't go to I remember that because I lived nine months in Ukraine. I think that's such a rich theme. It's going to be hard for us to cover it now. But yes... I think that's absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, this is to um, ask about Ukraine al along this um, specific experience that I see. Um, I think that given the wars, the crisis, the driving down of living standards, what I find actually against actually what a lot of people are saying 
And I'm not talking about racist incidences or anti-Semitic instances. I'm talking about anti-Semitism in a general sense and racism in a general sense. I think it's a lot lower in, the, in many countries in the world today. It's a lot lower. And one of the experiences I pick up on is when there are incidences, it's the disbelief, it's a horror, it's the people coming together and it's the people responding immediately when it happens, like in the case of the attack on a Jewish uh, community centre when a gunman walked in and killed 11 people in the United States. And then the next day there were school children. That was so immediate. Sorry, what's the question? I'm sorry, we've yeah, yeah, we run yeah. out of time. My question is, in Ukraine, when you do mention these incidences, do you find people are responding? Um, that's, that's very interesting. Okay, yeah. I got the question. So listen, I'm going to take those. There's so many interesting questions. I'm going to take three or four of those and, and put them into one, which is how is the Holocaust and the question of local collaboration? I mean, Ukraine was occupied for virtually the whole of the Second World War taught in schools, how is it faced up to, it's not just a, an issue in Ukraine, uh, it's an issue in, in all the countries that were caught in the middle uh, during, during the Second World War, um, certainly a, a very big theme in the Baltic states. Um, how, how is this being tackled just on the level of basic education? Uh, there is a recent uh, episode, uh, the two scholars from Lviv, which is Western Ukraine, which is supposed to be the most nationalist part of the country, wrote a textbook for the kids in the school in which they uh, clearly stated, implicitly stated, that Shukhevich, the one who was called to Bandera, was col collaborationist, which uh, provided uh, open the scandal, uh, most from the nationalist uh, part of the now political spectrum, which tried to say to bring these uh, young scholars, uh, historians, to responsibility in some sense. What happened there, it's just an illustration, that it raised a huge uh, uh, resistance from community of historians, which uh, show, uh, show letter of support, send letter of support, that there is no way for, political, uh, for politicians to interfere into history and the teaching of the history, and what the historians are right, because it, basically Ukraine is a free country, and if so far if their profession is enough, they are willing to write whatever they will. This is just illustration, so to say. But what about school textbooks? Stuk school textbooks. Uh, uh, since I don't know how many years, but for a long time, Holocaust is the part of the regular schedule in the schools. It has been accepted on the government level and supported by some international uh, uh, documents. There's some consensus about that. So this is the protocols here. This is, this is, this is a part, this is not, not even discussed, so to say. The other problem is to tackle the, the responsibility of Ukrainian nationalists. Some of, some of the texts does are responsible, most of them they are not, so to say. But still there is some, something which is, which, is, which is there. I believe this is your question about Stalin and Bandera. There is a presumption the history, historical memory and history is the same. It's not the same. Because getting a history wrong is a part of being a nation. If history would get getting right, there will be no nation, so to say. This is something which means that nation has to have a wrong history. You see what I mean here? And has to have a hero in this sense. So what I'm talking about Bandera is not exactly we're talking about real Bandera. Is the way it presented for the very political purposes, specifically in the country which is raging the war against against uh, uh, Russia. Presumably, hypothetically, if Ukraine will be waging a war against Hitler, most likely Stalin will be a hero of Ukraine as well. Because this is something which responds, something responds So the point is, and this again, about ambivalence, this kind of the how, how come. Basically, ambivalent is a very natural state of the social consciousness of many Ukrainians. Given good historical data, historical data, many Ukrainians who support, who see, them, who see Bandera as the hero, simultaneously they see Peter the Great as the hero as well. How come? It's exactly ambivalence. It's ambivalence, no, but not Stalin. Stalin and Bandera is mutually exclusive. But Peter the Great and Bandera works together very well. Because this is some state of the society which went under the trauma. 
deep trauma. And such a, if there's a trauma, this is kind of what we know. This is kind of this ambivalence. We could reconcile the six things with which historians could not reconcile. Educate people reconcile. But the people on the street, they could easily do. When uh, talking about the uh, anti-Semitism, which uh, Harold raised, without a doubt, there's no denying this fact. And there's um, anti-Semitism is very multilateral, multifaceted uh, phenomena. It's better said about the plural, anti-Semitisms. There was anti-Semitism. This kind of Semitism that uh, Harold described, yeah, it exists very well. But the difference is, is you could hardly find this Semitism on the level of the public discussions on politicians, so to say. Very rarely. There's a political leader who dare to produce this kind of anti-Semitic anti -Semitic arguments in the political discourse, so to say. So this, I believe, is the crucial difference. This is a crucial difference. We say something about Ukraine, very, very, very important. I do want to touch very briefly, we're over the time, but this question of what was the Soviet Ukrainian Jewish experience, was there one? I mean, were there writers who tried to find a way through it? I mean, was it culturally no, expressed or? The, for a very short period, in 20s, only in 20s, there were some uh, examples exactly of the Soviet Ukrainian Jewish, not Ukrainian identity, Ukrainian Jewish identity. There were some writers, like Ivan Kulik, they're not, not known nowadays, but in the 20s, yeah, in the event is when the Soviet Ukraine has emerged, and many believe this is not just Soviet Ukraine, but really Ukraine, there are some groups of the Ukraine Jewish intellectuals who, uh, who define themselves as Ukraine. But this is a long story, this was much forgotten, and mostly these people have been perished and killed by Stalin in the 30s. So this is now the story has to be rewritten. Wojciech, a last word. Yeah, sure, more. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I give you, I'll, I'll give you six years. No, I'll give you um, one minute. <laughs> з приводу, ну, якщо хвилину, тоді по це буде пунктир. Останні роки є державна підтримка політики пам'ятні, зокрема пам'яті жертв Голокосту. Нема часу розповідати про це, я можу годину говорити. А, ви кажете, що це дуже вузько рахувати відсотки. Але ми рахуємо не тільки відсотки, я вам показав, ми рахуємо інциденти антисемітські, ми рахуємо соціологічні дослідження, просто не було часу їх наводити, якщо ви потім підійдете, я вам покажу. Ми рахуємо не тільки, скільки було націоналістів, які не пройшли в парламент. У нас євреїв пів відсотка населення, а в парламенті їх більше десяти відсотків. Або це також не показує вам, що у нас низький рівень антисемітизму. Це як віра, або вона є, або її нема. Я це вивчаю 30 років, я вас запевняю, що сьогодні в Україні набагато менше антисемітизму, ніж було раніше. У нас пік приходив на 2007-2008 роки, у нас нема державного, і у нас набагато менше антисемітизму, ніж в Західній Європі. По колаборації дуже складне питання. Тож, я з Буковини. Буковина була у 40-му році захоплена Совєтським Союзом. Вона ніколи не була російською до цього. Ніколи. Це була анексія. І були українці, були румуни, і були євреї, які співпрацювали з совєтською репресивною владою. Вони були колаборанти? Чи ви рахуєте тільки тих, хто співпрацював з німцями колаборантами? Ось це подвійна бухгалтерія. Якщо рахувати колаборантів, то всіх і тих, і тих. Або подумати, чи правильно ми їх позначаємо. Чи є майбутнє євреїв України? Якщо вона, як ми очікуємо, стане європейською країною колись, через багато років, то в них є таке майбутнє, яке є у євреїв всієї Європи. Якщо вона, не дай Боже, стане авторитарною країною, то, звичайно, там буде різко зменшуватися кількість через еміграцію. Ви знаєте, що останні роки еміграція з Франції в Ізраїль, євреїв, більше, ніж з Донбасу, де йде війна. Ось і все. Ідентичність українського єврея – це наша дискусія з паном Ярославом. Я вважаю, що ідентичність такого гатунку, як британські євреї, французькі євреї, українські євреї, можливо тільки в вільній країні, в незалежній країні і бажано в демократичній країні. 
Були приклади і раніше, культурні зв'язки були. Я читав поетів, які писали українською мовою. Але я кажу, коли я розділяю це совєтські євреї, євреї України і українські євреї, ось цю ланцюжок, я маю на увазі євреїв українських після 91-го року. Вони себе ототожнюють з Україною, хоч вони ідентичні євреї. Вони розмовляють українською мовою, знають українську літературу, знають українську історію. Вони разом з іншими будують майбутню Україну. Оце означає для мене українських євреїв. Okay, I'm going to, we didn't get into the subject I wanted to, which is the influence of what I think is of Ukrainian folk culture and literature on Hasidic literature. I consider the Hasidic authors Ukrainian authors, writing in the tradition of Gogol and Bulgakov, who I consider Ukrainian authors. But we're not going to do that today. That's going to be a whole different session. Um, okay, thank you so much. And um, thank you so much for staying later as well.